If you're a guest today, we're especially glad that you're here. I don't want to confuse you in any way, shape, or form. We're just trying to point people to Christ. We're trying to build vertical and horizontal relationships, man. So a couple things that I'm excited about before I get into the message is we got water baptism today. So we got some people getting baptized in this service today. So excited about that. The, uh, I'm excited about uh, getting together with our adult singles uh, right after this service. We're meeting at the Oriental Star Restaurant across from Walmart. If you don't know if you're an adult single, just check, ask someone nearby you and go, am I an adult? Ask them that, and then check your left hand. If you're married, you're not an adult single. The, uh, if you're not married, please come, hang out with us. We'd love to have you join us for lunch. And uh, last week we started this series on prayer, and we talked about doing a five by five, five minutes a day, five days a week. Five minutes a day, five days a week. And I've seen so many amazing things. I've had two people hit me up after uh, the first service and after the second service and talk about their amazing prayer time this past week. And I had one person tell me in the middle of the week they had never spent five minutes in prayer in their life. This person's in their mid-30s. And if we're, not, if, we're, if, if we're a religious Pharisee, we're going to go, I can't believe that. But if we're not a religious Pharisee, we're going, that's awesome, man. Moving forward. You know what happens when you move forward? You end up somewhere you want to be. That's where you end up if you go forward. We've all been backwards before, right? And some of us have done a lot of sideways before. <laughs> but if we go forward, we end up somewhere we want to be because it's direction, not intention, that determines, anybody? Destination. destination. It's direction. If they're moving forward, I'm like, yeah. So the question we've been asking is this, is what if prayer in your life was fruitful instead of frustrating? Because frequently, prayer can be frustrating. Oh, I did it. Nothing happened. I must have done it wrong, or he must not be there. Prayer can be frustrating. I'd like to help you get to the spot in your life where your prayer time is actually a fruitful time, that it would flow instead of feeling forced. Now, we have a structure that we're teaching everyone because from the structure, you can get started to a spot where you can flow with it. Let me get a quick show of hands in here. How many of you at any time in your life have ever golfed? Mini golf does not count. You've golfed. Okay, put your hands down. Now, how many of you would say, yep, I'm a golfer? Put your hand up. Look, look around. One or two guys, exactly, exactly. Now, don't raise your hands on this one, but if I were to say how many of you have ever prayed, nearly everyone put their hands up. Even atheists eventually put their hand up because they realize they shouted out to God sometime. But how many of you would say, I'm someone that, pr I'm a prayer. Yeah, that's, you have to do it on a regular basis. And it's not a, re it's not a religious thing, it's not a legalistic thing. It's a, if you do it more often, it can flow instead of feel forced. Example, the church I was at in Wichita, uh, I was there for six years, I had a pastor that uh, on a regular basis, maybe twice a month, would walk into my office, put a sticky note on my desk while I was on the phone, and it said, tea time, 1.15, and named the golf course. So naturally, I was a good employee. Mm -hmm. And I went ahead and showed up at the golf course at 1.15, and I got to the spot where my golf game was decent. I used to play military golf. Y'all know what military golf is? Left, right, left, right, left, right, balls all over the place, right? By the time I left Wichita, I cracked 80 once. And that's counting, counting mulligans and counting OBs, for those of you that know golf. Ah, man, my golf game flowed. And then I moved to Pittsburgh, Kansas, and became the pastor. Instead of a youth pastor at a church of 1,000, I became the pastor of 30 people. My golf game fell to pot. It was horrible. I still can't golf anymore. I go out now, I'm lucky, I'm lucky if I only lose six balls instead of five. That's how I keep scoring out. Why? Because I don't do it anymore. And now when I do it, it's forced. It doesn't flow. Before, when I was playing regularly, my golf game flowed. And it was one of those things where mistakes were rare. And staying in the fairway was, it got, it got enjoyable. I know for some of you, the idea of golf enjoyable, those two words don't go together, like fun run. Yeah, those two words don't go together. But when you get, and you keep going, and you get past the, the awkwardness of learning anything. I coached volleyball, uh, uh, my first youth pastor position, one of the things I did is I coached volleyball at the local high school. It's the only sport I was ever really good at. And you watch Olympic volleyball, male or female, it is beautiful and intricate. You watch middle school girls volleyball, <laughs> it is painful. It's painful in everyone. One team is going to have one person that can serve really hard, and everyone else, you know, all 85 pounds of them go, Ooh, and they get pulverized by the serve. It's painful, but they got to start somewhere. And nobody starts awesome at anything. Kitchen? No, they don't start awesome in the kitchen. Math, they don't start awesome. Someone might have a head start. Public speaking, instruments. So don't think that you're going to start awesome at prayer. Think that you're going to start. My job is to get you to the spot where it's fruitful. 
Because when life is hard, and it will be sometime, I wish you had my prayer life. Not because mine's much better than yours, but mine probably has more foundation because I've been going at it for 32 years. And I've been trying to seek God and keep Him first in my life for 32 years. Let's get a real quick show of hands. How many of you are not even 32 years old? Exactly, and we're glad that you are here. Even if you're a millennial, we're glad you're here. We love millennials here. But you don't have that foundation. But I wish I could just take it and give it to you. When the doctor says something you don't want to hear, when your parents say something you don't want to hear, when the professor says something that you knows it's going to cost you another semester now. I wish you had my prayer life. But what I can do is get you connected to my prayer life in such a way that you can take it as if it's a fire and you can go ahead and bring your twig over and get you started. If mine happens to be a bonfire, you can at least get a piece of kindling over and get your starter, which is going to be enough to set your entire forest ablaze if we can move forward with it. And we can. And we can. Because at the end of the series, if you don't have a prayer life that's moving forward, I have failed. I can tell you a ton of stuff about prayer, and you'll be illumined, but you'll still be in the dark. I can tell you a ton of stuff about prayer. Oh, that's good. Oh, that's good. That's good. i got 80 pages of stinking good I can give you, literally. Trust me, I've only got four today. Chill out. You're good. You're good. But all you're going to do is be informed instead of transformed if you actually don't pray. So that's why we set it up as simple as we can. My name is Mark. I'd like to be your friend. I'd like to be your prayer coach. I'd like to help you get further, faster, so that when you pray, it's fruitful instead of frustrating. And I think I can help you get there. How close do you want to be? How do you want your clicker to work? Let's restart it here and see if, see if it's going to work for me this time. If you're up top, it may up top, we seem to be stuck. Daniel, thanks, man. How close do I want to be to God? This is a question from last week. How close do I want to be to God? You can be as close to God as you want to be, and you are. And you are. I want to hopefully somehow inspire you to get closer. Not because it's going to get you a better spot in heaven, or not because it makes you more religious, but because it pleases God. And I know it's going to help you like crazy if you get closer to him. So what does forward look like to you? For the one gentleman that shared with me, he never prayed five minutes before his entire life, forward was actually praying five minutes. For some of you, praying only five minutes a day would be a backward step. But for most of us, just praying on a regular basis, on a daily basis, is moving forward, and forward is good. So we set up this very simple, and we didn't set it up. This is actually extremely old. This is how I learned to pray. It was challenging you to spend five minutes a day even just five days a week. Spend one minute in awe before God. Do that with, by singing a song. Do that in worship. Do that in just reminding yourself, you're God, I'm not. One minute in awe. One minute confessing your sins. One minute confession. If you want to use, take, have notes when you're praying and remind yourself, oh, what's next? Use notes. If you want a timer, use a timer. I used a timer one time this past week just to, to see, and I realized I was cutting confession short. <laughs> I was. One minute in, in thanks. Can you give God, can you take one minute? You know how to watch commercials really long. Come on, this is, this is, this is one-fifth of a Netflix episode. 24-minute episode is one-fifth of it. Can you give God thanks for one minute? And then take two minutes for, for your needs. That's what supplication stands for, bringing your needs before God. It's not confusing. It's not complicated. It's simple and clear. But simple and clear makes us think that it's not powerful. And there, that's where you would be mistaken. But you could do this. I could set something up really hard where you've got to read a ton of your Bible and pray for hours a day, and you go, I can't do that. You can do this. And that's what kind of elbows some of you today. Crud, I could do that. I'd like to tell you it'd be worthwhile to do that. It'd be worthwhile to do that. So the Scripture says this in Luke 18. Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them they should always pray and not give up. They should always pray and not give up. So as I shared last week, I'm not going to pound your head and say, you need to pray, you need to pray, you need to pray. Chances are, if you're here, you probably know, yeah, I probably ought to pray more. But tell me how. We're definitely going to get there. But first, I want to start with what exactly prayer is. Because for some of you at your age, when I was 19, let me tell you how I defined a prayer. Oh, prayer. You want to know, oh, my 19-year-old self will tell you this. Prayer. Oh, that's when I have problems in my life, like girlfriend problems or academic problems. And prayer is what I do is when I yell at God and go, God, you got to help me. And then I make a bargain with him. God, if you do what I want, when I want, how I want, I'll go ahead and do this. I'll show up. Yeah, I'll actually be there on a Sunday. I, I will. Cross my fingers. Cross my heart. Hope to die. Stick a needle in my eye is the same kind of incantation that a witch doctor would use 
They just do it differently with maybe a drop of goat's blood and something else. All that we're missing is the, is the lamp to go ahead and, and rub and hope the genie comes out. That's how I treated prayer. And if that's what you think prayer is and that's how you think it works, no wonder it's frustrating. Because you're praying to a God that doesn't answer prayer like that. Doesn't answer a prayer like that. And that's not the purpose of prayer. So very non-rocket scientist, I'd like to walk you through a couple things. And the first is actually why we named the series. The first thing on your notes is prayer is answering God. It's answering the God who's already been speaking. Now you've got to get your, your minds on for a moment philosophically, but think with me for a moment. All speech is answering speech. Let me say that again. All speech is answering speech. You only speak because you were spoken to. Oh, you may have come out of the womb squealing, <laughs> just like a pig coming out. You may have been squealing, but you weren't speaking. You speak when you were spoken to. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit already have love amongst them. They didn't need Adam and Eve to be able to go ahead and show love to somebody. And they already had communication and conversation in between them. But what if they had never spoken to Adam? Would Adam even know what speech is? We speak because we've been spoken to. A missionary story I recently read was a missionary, you know, I don't remember where it was, but it's a very poor area. And pretty much in the poor areas, what are they doing? They're trying to find food and they're having ridiculously large families. The different, are usually broken families because the ladies know how to get pregnant and the guys know how to get them pregnant, but they don't know how to stick around. And so you have a bunch of 13 and 14 year old girls carrying their one, two, and three year old brothers and sisters on their back. And the missionary noticed something really unique. All these one, two, and three year olds were quiet. And it wasn't because they were wonderfully parented and wonderfully well behaved. Because nobody talked to them. The 13 year old wasn't excited to have the two year old on, on her back all day. Nobody talked. Nobody spoke to them. So they would, what, what on earth are they going to say back? So when we talk to God, when we come down to the altar like we will today, and whether you kneel or stand or whatever, all talk to God is answering speech. We are continuing the conversation that he already started before we even had our ears on. He'd already been speaking when we weren't listening, whether that's through his word on what you know about what the scripture says, whether that's through his creation, not just God's word, but God's world, whether that's through his grace that is drawing you. Well, I gave my life to Jesus. You could not give your life to Jesus until he drew you first. God is always previous. Oh, I know that, Pastor. God's first, God's first, God's first. No, he's not just first. He's always previous. Whatever your response is, that's just what it is. It's not an action. It's not an initiation. It's a response. No one finds God. God draws them and leads them, and sometimes they surrender to him. He is always previous. So here's the thought. If we're trying to move our prayer from frustrating to fruitful and flowing, what if instead of praying today to get answers, you prayed to give answers? What, is, what, is, what does God need to know from me? He doesn't need to know anything. He needs you to become aware of some things. And you can become aware when you spend time humbling yourself and answering what he's already been speaking. But I've never heard his voice. Just come down and start talking about what's on your heart. That's what he's already been nudging you toward. We're responding to him. We're answering God. And would that make prayer seem like it's more fruitful and flowing in your life instead of frustrating and forcing just some religious duty I have to do? See, when we don't pray, it's not we're, not we're not doing a religious duty. When we don't pray, we're not treating God as God. I mean, could you imagine? Gentlemen, how does it work in your house when your wife talks and you don't respond? How does that work in your house? You wouldn't be in your house very long. He speaks. He's waiting for us to answer. You're, you're able to answer. You know what to do when your phone rings. Oh, crud, no. Not that one. Oh, yeah, I'll answer that one. He's calling. He's calling. And he's not calling to beat you up. He's not calling because he's mad at you. He's calling because he's mad about you. And he wants to have that time with you. Let's keep moving. You can do this. Will you? It's up to you, but you can do this. Next, prayer is inward-based inward based modern people live their life outside in let me explain they look at their outward circumstances hey how am i doing socially how am i doing financially how am i doing physically how do people see me how do they perceive me they perceive me good well then i feel good about myself in inside 
Modern people live outside in. Hey, I'm looking on the outside, and the outside dictates, dictates how I feel on the inside about myself. It's my confidence. It's my self-esteem. How am I perceived by others? Therefore, that's how I feel, and that's what I am inside. They live outside in. Believers, especially, not just people that believe in Jesus, but are actually following him, and especially when they have a prayer time and a regular prayer life, we don't live outside in. We live inside out. It doesn't matter what's happening on the outside. It doesn't change who we are. Matter of fact, we live from the inside. And I know who I am because when I spend time with God, and because of that, now I take that to my outward circumstances. And it does not matter how good everyone thinks of me out there. I've got to confess my sins to God on a regular basis. I know I can still be humble. It doesn't matter how bad everyone thinks I am out there or how poorly I'm, I'm, I'm being perceived. I know that he still loves me and he's crazy about me and he wants me to spend time with him. Therefore, I can still be, still be confident in spite of my mistakes, in spite of my failures. If we prioritize our outer life, our inner life gets dark. We all walk around, well, I'm confident. I'm, I'm, I'm in good spiritual health. But inwardly, we're, we're not there. Inwardly, we've got self-doubt and anxiety. On the outside, we say, I'm, I'm, I'm emotionally well. I'm, I'm totally whole and, and strong. But inwardly, we have self-pity and grudges if we're focusing on the outside to lift us up on the inside. And I know you already know this, but you have no control of anything that's happening on the outside. Matter of fact, some of the stuff that's happening on the outside, you wish you had control over because you would send it back to hell. But you can't. But you do have control when you humble your knees. Humble yourself. You get on your knees before God. And you do have control to say, those things don't have to define me anymore. Who I am in Christ defines me. And I get reoriented and refocused. And if you want to use the GPS analogy, recalculated every time my knees touch the ground and my heart goes up. Unless we prioritize our inner life, we turn into hypocrites. We try and project ourselves, I'm a humble, unassuming person. Well, do you confess your sins to God? No, then how are you humble and unassuming? Uh, I want to be positive and cheerful. Well, good, be positive and cheerful. Do you thank God habitually? Well, I do at the end of November every year then you're probably not a very positive and cheerful person. You're faking it, which we've all done. We've all done. I'm not up here telling you I've never done that. If we focus on our outward life, our internal life gets scary. Solitude is unnerving and self-examination is uncomfortable, which means confessing your sins is like rape, cutting your identity out from underneath you. If you're basing your life on the outside, confessing your sins is like cutting down your self-esteem. It's cutting down your worth, your identity. Yet, it's pretty obvious that we've all sinned and forgiveness is going to happen through confessing them. But when we prioritize our inner life with prayer, those circumstances aren't going to change who we are and confession doesn't demean us. It just reminds us that sins don't define us and failure is not fatal. Because the cross already told me I'm not worthy, but the cross also screamed I'm not worth less. So I can move forward confessing my sins with humility and confidence. If you can't confess your sins because you feel too bad doing it, you haven't understood the cross and you haven't understood the grace that Jesus Christ offers. You're still trying to be religious and yet God smile by being good. Please leave that. That's not going to give you hope and that's not going to give you life. When we humble ourselves before God and we prioritize our inner life with prayer, we can have authenticity. We can know who we are before God. Yeah, I'm a mess. Yet I can still move forward to that holy God without shame and know that I'm forgiven. And I can move forward in that way. The real you, warts and all. Warts and all. The real you can talk to the real him. Holiness and all. And we can move forward with humility and confidence. So if we stop right here, it looks like prayer is inward based. So prayer is just a pious form of talking to yourself. Prayer is just self-therapy. No, it's way better than that. Let's keep moving. Because prayer is upward focused. It's upward focused. Prayer is not inward. We're not exploring our own subjectivity going, I need to meditate and focus on what this means and let my mind go to neutral and wander. No, meditation is not letting your mind go into neutral and wander. Sometimes we open our minds so much our brains fall out. Meditation is putting your mind in drive and knowing where you're headed. Up towards God, not deep into myself. 
up towards God, not deep into myself. The more time I spend with God, we'll talk about this later in the series, I, my, I am most self-aware when I'm most in his light. And when I'm most in his light, I'm most self-aware that I don't need more of me. I need less of me and more of him. So therefore, when I pray, I don't want to get deeper into myself. I want to get more up to him. So I am not trying to go ahead and uh, line myself up with an inward path of self-discovery, but upward to align myself with Christ. Paul put it this way. To believers and if you're not a believer here today one i'm glad you're here and two there is strength and help in a simple meditation there's nothing wrong with it at all i would encourage you to get your, your mind focused on christ and then utilize meditation in that way but paul wrote this to believers since then you've been raised with christ set purposeful intentional non-accidental set your hearts on things above why because Christ is seated up there. Keep your focus on Christ. Set your hearts, your emotions on things above. And then set your mind. Set again. Set. Intentional. Purposeful. Not accidental. Set your minds. Not just your emotions and your heart, but your thoughts as well on things above. Why? Because everything on earth is going to ask for your attention. Instagram, all the social media, uh, Netflix, everything's asking for your attention. Set your minds on things above. From another series we did a long time ago, uh, uh, a focus on earth is beneath your future. A focus on earth is beneath your future. We can go better and we can go deeper. But we stay upward focused in prayer. Because when we pray, we're not talking to ourselves. We're conversing with another, capital A, boom, capital A, and another who is there, who is very unique, who is not the same as you. It's not like talking to your, your imaginary self friend right over here who's your buddy buddy. But he's also not someone so unique that he's inaccessible and, and so far from you. And that conversation is not performance-based. It's relationship-focused. It's not, well, hey, if I'm really good, I can make my list before him, and maybe I'll get some of what I asked for. When you have to put something in to say, hey, I just gave you something, now will you give me something back? That's either a vending machine or a prostitute. He is neither. If all he wanted was obedience, he could squeeze it out of us. He wants relationship. And that will make you more you than you've ever been. Not just making you more into a cookie cutter and what a believer is supposed to look like. When we persist in prayer, that another takes up the other side. I want revenge. This another says, forgiveness is good. When you complain, he says, thanking is good. Be grateful. Now some of you, you, you were here last Sunday. And you came down to the altar and you prayed for five minutes, or if you're legalistic, you prayed for four minutes and 46 seconds and beat yourself up at lunch. Get over it. The, uh, but you got up and you go, man, that was awesome. Man, look, goosebumps. Oh, this is so good. And then you tried it on Tuesday and there were no goosebumps. And you're going, I didn't feel the presence of God. Did God feel the presence of you? And if he did, isn't that part of the goal as well? He wants to experience your presence not because we're so awesome but because it pleases him and what do we do oh i'm i'm a master you don't want me god you don't want me and that probably displeases him more than anything if we're not careful we'll act like the 24 year old son that has blown the inheritance and, and broke our parents hearts and never calls home while mom and dad are sitting there staring at the phone did he call today no did he call today no and the parents are just waiting again he's not mad at you as much as he's mad about you and he'd love to have that time with you. So what if we quit hiding ourselves from him when in reality he's just waiting for us to respond so we can give an answer to the conversation he already started when we didn't even want to listen? I mean, what does it say about a, about a personality that God is that he speaks when he knows you're not listening just because he can't wait for the moment you do start listening? And what does he want to hear? Your answer. But I don't know if I have the right answer. If it's your voice and your heart, it's the right answer. Because he's not going to get anywhere with you without a conversation. If he just wanted your attention, you wouldn't make it home in one piece. He wants that relationship, friends. Prayer is not you getting in touch with the inner you. Oh, I just need to get in touch with me deep. No, prayer is the inner you having a communication with a God who started this conversation and is so glad that he might finally have your attention. So when we start answering God in prayer, our inner life starts to take shape where we can have authenticity 
coming face to face with our sin and our wickedness, but at the same time realizing that we can move forward in his love and his grace. We have that authenticity, and then our hearts are refocused upward and not inward into our problems or even worse, into our pride. What does that? Well, you can start with just five minutes a day, five days a week. It's not complicated. It's not confusing. But it doesn't lack power. So what does forward look like to you? Does forward to you mean two minutes a day? Five days a week? If that's forward, go for it. Go for it. If that's forward, do it. Whatever forward is, forward is good. Forward is good. So that's why we set the prayer bar in reality. I could give you something really difficult. Why well, won't you to read and pronounce the names of books that you can't even find in your Bible? You should read this and read this. Then you should pray like this and pray, pray really long. And then you'd go, oh man, that's hard. I can't do that yet. I'll try it later in the future. Instead, we set it where a five-year-old could do it. Not because... You have to only be as smart as a five-year-old, but you have to be as willing as the five-year-old. How close do you want to be to God? You can be as close as you want to be, and you are. So let's run through it one more time because we're not trying to be complicated, and you can jot the notes down if you want, and you can bring your notes down to the altar. A minute of awe. If you're not sure what to do, just sing with Zeke. A minute of confession. If you're not sure if you've sinned, ask someone who knows you really well. They can help you. A minute of thanks. And yeah, you want to bring a watch down? I don't care. Two minutes of supplication. Because that's normally where we go first, right? I don't need that kind of structure to pray. That's, that's just, that's, uh, that's a straight jacket on me. Well, if you're not careful, you'll do what you do at the buffet, man. You just grab what you want, never what you need. And if we're not careful, prayer will be the same way. We'll just go to what's natural for us, which is gimme, 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 which is not the healthy thing. So in just a moment, we'll come down to the altar. And if you want to come down and kneel, you can kneel. If you want to come down and stand, you can stand. I mean, last week and this week, we had people down here with their cane. Uh, Pauline, who comes first service in a wheelchair, she waited until everyone came down, then her son wheeled her down because she wasn't going to be left out. Can't I pray in my seat? Absolutely, you can. Will you? Or will you probably do what you would normally do and just sit there and I'm going to watch Zeke? Hey, Zeke, doing all right? Yeah, he's doing good. Zeke says hi. God's the one who wants your attention. Well, who are they going to sing to if we're all down at the altar? Silly, they're not singing to you anyway. They're singing for you as an example of what you can do. Stand with me, would you? I can go deeper, but I'm not trying to impress you. I am trying to influence you. So in just a moment, we'll invite you down to the altar. And come down and find a spot. If you're one of the first ones down, don't block the aisle. Find a spot. Find a spot in the corner. You want to stand, stand. If that doesn't work for you and you just want to turn around and kneel where you're at, go ahead. Zeke, your next song here is about how long? How long does it last? Five, six minutes. If you get up before you leave, no one's going to take your photo and say, they didn't make it a full five minutes. Man, if you run four laps or you run three laps, you're doing better than everybody on the couch. Can we bow our heads and our hearts across this place?